I, I don't know how this has happened with my son, but he is very into football. <laughs> like if he he always wants so he always wants to do one of two things when I pick him up. He wants to daddy football game or go to a party. And I'm like, son, do you know who your father is? Go to a party. <laughs> I am going to do none of those. Go to a party. Uh, I'm, no. I'm sure as hell not going to a party. And if you want me to go to a sports game, it needs to be basketball. But yeah, so I don't know. But he's very into football right now. So we were at the AT and T store today picking up phones. And uh, he saw they had a football game on. So he's like, oh, football. Come on, Dad. And so we went and sat down. And as soon as we sat down, he said, oh, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. I'm like, where are you picking this up from? Kid's going to be a jock. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. And we were, we, were hang- we were eating lunch with somebody today, and she said, hey, you know, if he ever wants to do FHA or... Uh, not F A J. What is it called? Four H. <laughs> this is how much I'm not into it. Four H. If you ever wants to do four, I got him covered. If you ever wants to loan somebody a home, if your two year old wants to loan someone a home, I can walk him through that <laughs> process. <laughs> uh, no, but she said like I like I can take into people who know animals and like I just for a second I flashed forward to me being the. Was it FF dad? FH dad? 4H. Really, 4H. I should really learn this if my son's going to be really into it. 4H. <laughs> Hello, friends. My name is Marlo Bogus, and you're listening to the Tales to Inspire podcast. Undercover, and with an intent to kill. Deep in the heart of Nazi Germany, the heroes of Operation American Defense brush shoulders with the socialites, soldiers, and psychophants of the Nazi regime. With bated breath, the heroes await the arrival of the Fuhrer and their opportunity to end his dictatorship. As we open up this issue of Tales to Inspire... We see a concrete building with the red Nazi flags draped over these marble columns. And it's just this unflattering brick of a building, a a testament to Aryan architecture uh, and the kind of architecture that Adolf Hitler would love to see spread over the continent of Europe. But anyways, we see this garish building. And in the top left corner, we see a little yellow box that says, April 1944, Munich, Germany, Haus der Kunst. And before we get to where all of you are, we are actually going to do a move. Uh, So I I have come up with a move. First, let me send it to all of you. Um, But it's just simply called, Enter the Haus der Kunst. Um, because <laughs> this is a very secretive, clandest- clandestine operation. Uh, and so I didn't want everybody to just roll uh, a sneak around roll and for us to like interpret everybody's individual results. So I made a custom move. Um, so let me go ahead and read it to you. I've posted it in the chat for you all to read. But let me go ahead and read this move. Uh, enter the house der Kunst. When you try to gain access to the Haus der Kunst, you must first choose one disadvantage, leave something or someone valuable behind, you encounter an obstacle that will require a teammate's help to overcome, or you do not enter where you thought you would. 
Once you've chosen one, describe to the table how you enter the Haus der Kunst and how you how your chosen disadvantage affects your entrance. So, I'd like everybody to choose one disadvantage. And just to put it out there, you are going into a place where uh, the most despised leader of the time is going to be. So security is going to be high. So those of you with weapons or with gadgets or something like that, uh, if you do somehow get your gadgets or weapons inside the Haus der Kunst, just make sure it is a good narrative explanation for how you did so. Um, but let's go ahead. Who would like to describe or tell me what disadvantage they have chosen and how they are entering uh, the Haus der Kunst? Uh, Gwen can go first. Um, yeah, sure. My first thought was she's got her, I'm, a, I'm assuming she said uh, gown last time because she's going to get dolled up for this. Sure. Um, so she's got her gown on and she's got her Dillinger pistol strapped to her thigh still. And as we're making our way to the door to go in, security stops to, you know, check everybody for weapons and as they're frisking her they find the gun and they're like oh you know nine nine stop take it uh, oh. yeah that's exactly and, and, what they say <laughs> nine nine stop don't do it please <laughs> angry german talk you know yeah. um I just realized nine. Okay, I thought it was like nine. Nine was a code. Like, uh, <laughs> you just mean no, no. Okay, cool. Yeah, don't you know? This I is didn't the, catch uh, that at first. Either. This is the popular cop comedy Munich ninety nine or nine nine. Damn yes, it, I Munich missed nine it. nine oh, Munich nine nine. Oh, nine nine. Oh, good. But Gwen's gonna use that opportunity as they're you know frisking her and they find the gun. She's just gonna try and kind of keep their attention on her just a little bit more to make sure the rest of her team can kind of get in somewhat easier. So if, you know, Doc has his gadgets he wants to get in, maybe the security's more focused on Gwen. So are you leaving your gun behind? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm going to leave behind. I'm going to let them take it. That would give everyone else the ability to, or other people, maybe not all of you, to use the encounter and obstacle uh, obstacle a teammate can help you overcome. Mm, Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're going to... You're gonna leave behind uh, your your advantage of a pistol. Yeah. So as soon as they grab it, she's just like, "Oh, I forgot that was there. I'm so sorry." And she's just putting hands on their cheeks and like patting them. It's like, "I, you can keep that. That's fine. I don't. You know, it went with the dress. That's really all that was for." Yeah. <laughs> and these these stern Nazi guards take your your tiny Derringer pistol and set it over. To the side with this other contraband. Who else? What do you have to do to gain access? I I can go along with um, you encounter an obstacle that require a teammates help to overcome. Um, okay. I'm very clearly a person of color walking into a very Nazi <laughs> um, yeah, era, yeah. so I think I probably got s- stopped and like searched mm. more than necessary, mm-hmm. and. Um, if I can, like, piggyback off Gwen's, um, maybe them finding a gun on Gwen, they kind of, like, took their attention off me. At least enough for me to, like, move my, like... Like, when he looks away, I, like, move my knives and, like, gun to a spot they've already checked so that they go down nice. to a new spot they haven't checked and just find nothing there kind of kind of deal. Good. And every time, every past. time they put their eyes on him, Gwen immediately tries to get their attention back on her just using her feminine mm. wants. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sweet. So Geiger Gwyn and Red Revenant have entered the building. I have a question. Yes. So I would I would like to leave all of my gear behind, but uh-huh. could I have created like just a simple ring that has some ability? Like a mini fusion fist that's just contained in a ring. Interesting. Um, I like this idea. Um, and let's say... Um, 
this doesn't this isn't quite use environment but i'm going to use those rules for this okay um so when you use something from the environment to suit your purposes the eic will tell you one or more it'll break quickly use it while you can it's dangerous the eic will say how it's particularly effective the eic will say how or you can use it but there will be a side effect the eic will tell you what it is so i think i think i'm going to choose it'll break quickly okay because it, it is a small device, and it will give you enough charge for you to do that fusion fist attack once Okay. Uh, during this, this um, event. I agree to that. Okay. Cool. So, yeah, I will leave all of my gear in the briefcase in our meeting place. All right. And you, you enter. They search you over. Uh, and I think as they search you over, like, it, it has a panel, like, your arms are extended. They're patting you down. But, like, there's a cut out or not a cut out a panel that like you know what i'm talking about like it has a circle around the ring and yeah. then it pops out maybe that's what it's called a pop out panel yeah but then it pops out and it shows that ring could you describe what what do we see in that pop out panel sure so it looks like a hefty metal ring like the almost like like a class ring or like a mason's ring something like that where it's like a heavy metal ring um, mm-hmm. and like it pops out and you can see like tiny mechanisms and a very small, um, like circuit that's in like, mm-hmm. it shows like it pops out and it's whatever. Um, but there's like a circuit mm-hmm. and then two, uh, contacts on the inside of the ring that directly connect to like contact his skin. Um, mm. and it just says fusion fist junior. You should fist <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so I think that um, Sister Solstice will use the complication that she doesn't enter where she thought she would. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's doing kind of her witchcraft, like the thing where she like, I can't remember how we described it before, but like she opens a door and it takes her to a certain, you know, like that kind of thing. And so she's opening a door and she's thinking that she's ending up like, she's thinking she's like walking in where everybody else is. And she ends up like walking. I don't know. I'm thinking like, maybe like backstage or like somewhere that like, she's clearly not supposed to be. I I really (laughs) like that. I really like that because that was actually a power that your house had. Yeah. Uh, but I like the idea that you have somehow made a door into like a mobile version of that that will work once. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, and uh, listeners, uh, Sister Solstice might have some different powers in this episode because we had a Sister Solstice issue 0.2 where we kind of <laughs> revamped some of her powers to make it more fun for Carrie to play her awesome. and not so um, reactive to be more proactive um so if you want to listen to that you can be a patron for five dollars a month and you could listen to that but anyways uh, yeah shameless plug uh (laughs) so sister solstice please describe what i I would assume you're still in like the basement y'all's meeting room Mm -hmm. and you're doing something to like want a door there so what what are you doing what does this look like yeah so okay so i have my wand out um and i'm really like i've been meditating and so i'm like in my head i have this picture of like okay like this is where i'm walking in like it's gonna be very inconspicuous like i am prepared for this and so i like move the wand in the shape of a door Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i take a deep breath and i um, instead of like going to turn the doorknob, like I stick the wand there and like move it like a doorknob mm. and I step through mm-hmm. and, uh, the next thing I know, like I'm clearly like in a backstage kind of like prepping area kind of yeah. thing. And like, I look around and I'm like, I don't see any of my people. Yeah. Cause I think the idea behind this was a child would obviously not have been allowed to come to this event. <laughs> so you had to find a way past the security guards. So you, you, I don't know, you found a blueprint or something and you're like, Oh, I will make a door right here out of the coat closet and I'll join you on the other side of the security check. Right. But when you open that door, <laughs> you open it out of a larder, out of a pantry and you are now in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> 
and there are these chefs running around frantically making things. You see a huge multi-tiered cake um, and all these other uh, things. And I think a chef sees you. Uh, what are you wearing as you step out of the closet? Well, you see, <laughs> not chef's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I was like somewhat dressed for the event, um, trying to look a little bit older. Uh, I think I had borrowed some clothes from. I feel like Gwen lent me some clothes, maybe oh, or something. Oh, I do Didn't remember we talk that. About that. Yes, I do remember that. Tried to doll um, you up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so this so. dolled up kid steps out of the pantry. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, so she opens it and realizes that she's like in a pantry, mm-hmm. and so I think she's gonna look to her um, right and grab like a jar of peanut butter or something, <laughs> and she's just gonna like be dipping her finger in and be like, "Oh, hey!" Like, just like try to play it off, like. Yes. <laughs> and I think a a chef sees you and frowns, and we see a word bubble come out of their mouth and we just see a bunch of German text because Sister Solstice does not speak German. Uh, And so thereby, neither does the reader. And so she has her peanut butter that she's dipped her finger in and they're speaking German and she's just like... (laughs) He, He takes a spatula and hits the peanut butter out of your hand and he takes one of those white smocks and kind of throws at you, throws it at you, all while saying this this German to you, and you have no idea what he's saying, uh, but he's gesticulating wildly while trying to giving you this white smock. I I put it on. Good. And then he gives you like a crate of vegetables and a peeler, or not a peeler, uh, just a knife. Again, little short text bubble, and he crosses his arms and looks down at you. I'm assuming he pointed at some point, and so I'm going to carry the crate where he pointed it Mm -hmm. and um, start chopping, because I have worked in a kitchen before with my mom. You have. You are are very adept at this. Yeah, so (laughs) you start getting in line with all these Nazi chefs just... Just cutting these vegetables. Okay. Hoping at some point I get to go out to the party and serve hors d'oeuvres or something. Yes. That's this, the goal. This is perfect. Um, this is fine. Okay. Everything's fine. And we we turn the page from the kitchen scene, uh, and I think we see Dr. Fusion, Geiger Gwyn, and Red Revenant all meeting up together. I wanted to real quick, David, say, yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, being able to sit and receive thoughts is something that's a pretty simple task, but there is skylights. I looked on bet pictures of this and there are skylights so i think that's the easiest way if she can see them she can send a thought or something she can send stuff if they're close enough and she i would Mm. think and she couldn't see them because she could reach out if she knows them well enough to like Mm -hmm. you know so maybe the one she's been working with she could reach out find their thoughts and send them something but it's easiest if she could see them so that's the way i was thinking we could kind of play this is up it to difficulty if she couldn't see them like a difficult action maybe she has something i don't know i was thinking about this might venture more on a magic thing but i was thinking if she had a focus like a item she could like of somebody's she could like push like like focus on to like Mm -hmm. align with their mind even if they were Mm -hmm. far away i think that's also an option okay so like something of theirs yeah like if one of them wanted to give her something before they left of like a little something of theirs i would like to be gross and i have an idea i think because obviously red revenant is so you would say like you kind of explain that usually it's easier for you to reach the people you've worked with a lot but having a focus of some kind helps right right and like yeah, yeah okay i have an idea you're not squeamish are you I mean, uh, okay, and just takes out a knife and cuts his finger off. <laughs> and he's just like, <laughs> holy. <sighs> uh, how would, how would that, oh. <sighs> uh, she pulls out a handkerchief and wraps this, like, still bloody finger up in it and, like, holds onto it. <laughs> Don't worry, honey. I, my, my daddy worked a real a farm when I was growing up. It wasn't a very successful farm. Uh, but I saw him slaughter a few chickens. This is like nothing, I guess. Okay. Just give me were like 10 minutes. Were we all minutes. here for this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I he think was, you were. Yeah, this was like a <laughs> yeah. prep for it. So we're just okay. watching it happen. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so you... <laughs> 
you have it you open it up you see the severed finger and then i think in the next panel we see red revenant's hand and like that finger has only grown back to the knuckle so it's just, he has a little <laughs> stubby pointer finger yeah oh my gosh it's not like a starfish right it's not gonna grow another red revenant from the finger. <laughs> oh, no. not that i'm aware of i don't know i usually leave the pieces behind so I don't. <laughs> there's probably a lot of red revenants running around now it's fine <laughs> So, what's the so what's the game plan? Are we spread, splitting up, sticking together? I have a lot of eyes on me right now. First thing, we gotta find the kid. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's gotta be around here somewhere. I don't see her at the moment. How about I find her? You two find the target. I doubt he was be here yet. Um... Perhaps we just mingle for a while. I, yeah, sure. Let's let's mingle. <laughs> he he says as a group of people are walking by, and we can obviously see that once again they are side eyeing him. I think I got a few fans already. So yeah, um, don't don't go alone anywhere, please. Stick with someone. For their sake, yeah, probably I will stick with someone. You're, yeah, that's... Mm-hmm. We need to not make a scene. That's all I'm saying. I'll try my best, but just one sideways comment and I will... I got my knives on me. It'll just be quick. I can probably, like, hide the body before anyone notices, right? That's fair. That's fair. Um, and then Gwen is just going to go and start walking away and she's be like, I'm going to find the kid. You do what you got to do. Oh, um, as... Gwen walks away um, to um, Dr. Fusion and I like, so they can, she can read our minds. So like, if I was like, and in his head, just starts saying poop, 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 just over and over again, just to see if he gets a response or anything. <laughs> you, you get back. I know you're just testing me, honey, but that's kind of disgusting. I mean, seven <laughs> fingers are one thing, but uh, feces, whole nother deal for me. <laughs> We all are poop, okay? It's nothing to be grossed out or ashamed of. So I, I turned to Dr. Fusion like, sorry, I'm, I'm having a conversation. That was very rude of me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it seems to be working. What is it like? Having someone in your head? Her powers do not work on me. I'm not sure what it... It is not an experience I've had. Um... I've I mean, I've only had one conversation that's really short and about poop. So I don't know if I can use that to really tell you what it's like. I can say it's not too different. It's just an extra voice going on up in there. At least for me. Well then. Come on. Meanwhile, on the rooftop of Haus der Kunst, um, we have a different group of heroes that have gotten onto the roof and I would like the three of you to also do the enter house stair Kuntz move um, and tell me what, what obstacle did you encounter? How did you overcome it? And just kind of narrate how do you get to the roof? Uh, and if you want to already have cleared the guards um, or like if you want to be in the process of clearing the guards, that is totally okay. I'll leave it up to you. I think upon landing... Crystal Gazer takes this deep breath and then the nearest guard or guards, like if there's a couple of them, she is going to influence them to um, lay down their weapons, have a seat, take a nap. Uh, and which which one of those complications are you choosing? Oh, yeah. So, um... Yeah, I think it's. I think that will kind of pair well with. I didn't enter where I thought I would, so my intent oh, was to okay. kind of land somewhere farther away from guards. But instead, I land a little too close. Um, and they maybe they see me. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, uh, so you don't enter where you thought you would, and you have to influence them to lay down their weapons. Okay, okay, uh, and. Yeah, let's go ahead and resolve that right now. Um, Marlo, would you please roll 
I guess influence someone would work here. Okay. Influence is plus two. Oh, but I have a negative two. So nine. Hmm. Okay. So on a nine, uh, do you want to burn a bond to step it up to a ten? Yeah, why not? I'm going to burn it with Julian. Like <laughs> okay. <said> <laughs> okay. Um, so on a 10 plus, they act now and do their best until the situation changes. So narrate for us. You, you land. The guards kind of pivot around. They see you. Their eyes go big. And we see like the surprise lines drawn above their head. And then what does Crystal Gazer do? <gasps> uh, uh, don't worry about it, boys. Lay your guns down. Take a nap. I got it from here. Okay, um, and so we just see little word bubbles come out of one of their mouths. It just says, "The uh, and then they lay down, put their rifles aside, and just lay down and curl up and take a nap. Nice. <laughs> what about the uh, what about the other two heroes? What complications do you encounter? I like to think that as Torchbearer lands, he gets like a a lay of the land, and he sees everything that happens with um, with Crystal Gazer probably on the far side of the roof and it looks like there there's some attention over there so it's like okay this could be my chance to, to sneak into the sneak in through the roof entrance and so I just, I just have to be quiet and should be able to get her on these cards no problem and he starts sneaking closer to the where he believes this entrance is. And um, suddenly, uh, like from behind a pillar, another soldier walks out and startles him. And he kind of kicks like a, a tar paint bucket and brush over and makes a little bit of noise. He's, shoot! Uh, and has to think quickly, uh, drawing the attention of the guards in his... Split decision. He's, oh, my friend. I, uh, I am, uh, how you say, drunk. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm stumbling about like a fool. Uh, enjoying a little bit too much of the uh, champagne. Okay, so. So the guard looks over and sees this Danish uh, art. What what were you, a Danish art? Art collector. Art collector, okay. A uh, Danish art collector stumbling across a rooftop, kicking over a tar bucket. Um, and uh, he frowns crossly and starts walking his way over to you. Uh, and I assume you chose, uh, you encounter an obstacle that will require a teammate's help to overcome? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this guard is walking in your direction uh, and omission uh, how do you enter I want to use you do not enter where you thought you would yeah how, how would that work do you guys have any suggestions because I'm trying to figure out because all I can think of is good things like he comes out with a servant outfit on the top roof <laughs> the, way, the way I had imagined it was mm -hmm. um Omission and kind of like gone a roundabout way through like a side entrance or a back entrance mm -hmm. to gain access, and then was supposed to meet us on the roof in order to like open a door so we could get down. Um, mm. And it kind of you know went sideways immediately. Yeah, yeah. Maybe omission was supposed to already be here, and these guards were already mm. supposed to have been gone. Um. So maybe it's you do not enter where you thought you would. Maybe it's you do not enter when you mm, thought you yeah. would. Yeah, that, that makes so way like, more sense. Yeah, like yeah. you're running behind schedule on killing these. Nazis. Yeah, like I'm 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 in the servants' quarter and someone's like, you know, hey, deliver this uh, these snacks to this location, and I'm like, oh, oh okay, and then I'm like, mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of cut to me like uh, uh, pouring wine for someone. Okay, 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 I like that. Um, and so then we see pouring wine for someone dressed in the servant's outfit, and we cut back up top to Crystal Gazer and Torchbearer being on a rooftop full of Nazi soldiers, uh, which are n not supposed to be here. Um, and Torchbearer, those two guards are walking towards you. 
I apologize. I know I am not supposed to be here. Uh, oh, Gert, honey, there you are. And you see her walk around like, sorry, we thought this would be a good place to have a little rendezvous. Uh, our uh, partners aren't exactly so aware. We would uh, appreciate your uh, discretion. Yeah. In, in this matter. <laughs> the guards look at each other and then look at you and we have the word bubble and then little asterisk that says translated from German. It says, get off the roof now. You are not allowed to be up here. Oh, we understand. Uh, I apologize. I just came up here to, to meet with my friend and I was so excited. I had to uh, take a little liquid courage and uh, my, my head is simply swimming right now. Uh, would you mind giving me ten minutes to get some fresh air and I feel woozy and he kind of like lean on and kind of <laughs> just like go dead leg and lean on this soldier oh, I apologize <sighs> and he's going to you lean on him and he's going to brusquely push you off do not touch me you have until the count of ten to get off this roof. Uh, and I assume neither of you speak German, uh, or does Torchbearer speak German? No. <laughs> okay, so you just... A bit we have... <laughs> yes. Uh, you just have uh, ten consecutive panels uh, with counting down in German... And Torchbearer and Crystal Gazer just don't don't understand. I mean, you could probably guess that he's counting down just by like the meter and tone of his voice. Uh, but as he's counting down, I would like omission, omission. You finally arrive to take out these guards. Please tell us how do you interrupt him while he's counting down with his pistol pointed at your teammates? <laughs> oh man. Um, so I'm just, like, gonna sidestep and come and, like, as they're pointing the gun at someone, I just, like, yoink. Okay. Are you, you're taking their gun? Yeah, yeah, I'm like, it's my gun. Perfect, perfect. It's, this is my gun now. Yeah, look, look uh, at me, this is my gun. Uh, I was gonna do something similar. And oh. Since he kind of takes their, like, retakes their attention off of Torchbearer by stealing mm-hmm. their guns, um... Torchbearer has like a very childish thought and just kind of reaches forward, grabs them by their belts Uh and just like pulls their belts off so their pants fall down. (laughs) And so they are looking at, (laughs) all of a sudden as they are pushing you towards the staircase they are suddenly pantsless and without guns. Uh, And they look at you and I think with nothing else they are going to try to rush to the ledge and scream down at the guards patrolling the around the periphery of this museum uh so they start to rush towards the ledge what do y'all do oh uh kill them <laughs> uh go ahead uh i think this would be a let's do a seize control all right. Uh, or, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> We've already done a seize control. Let's do a take a risk. I like that move more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, how, how are you going to try to stop them, Omission? Um, so using his, you know, uh, natural talents of being uh, forgotten, since they turned away, uh, he's just going to full-on sprint at them uh, and give them the people's elbow. <laughs> okay, uh, so this sounds like uh, rolling 2d6 with smash. So go ahead and roll 2d6 with smash. your smash stash. I got a 9. A 9, okay. So on a 7 through 9, you do it imperfectly. The EIC, the EIC tells you how your approach might lead to unexpected consequences. Accept those consequences or mark one stress. Hmm, 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 hmm. Okay, okay, okay. They're running towards a ledge. You are going to people's uh, elbow drop them. Uh, and you are going to succeed. You're going to take them out. But the price of this is as you elbow one, 
he goes toppling over the ledge of the Haus der Kunst, and he's going to land uh, next to the building where he is, his body I take will a presumably stress. be found. You take a stress. All right. <laughs> All right. So mark that stress, uh, and please describe for us how you take out these two guards. Yeah, so he runs forward, um, you know, sweat coming down uh, his tangled hair. Uh, jumps up into the air and with both elbows just stretching out, smashes it uh, behind their heads. Uh, and it looks like one's about to fall over the building, uh, but he just kind of like scampers over the edge and grabs the body by like the, the foot and just kind of like slowly drags it back up, wipes the sweat off on the, the Nazi guy's jacket. And she goes, Ooh. All right, we're, we're in. Hello, friends, and welcome to the mid-roll section of Season 1, Episode 12 of Tells to Inspire. I'm your host, David White, and welcome back from our winter mid-season break. I hope that everybody had a happy holiday season filled with family and friends and fun, and now we're getting back to tense action with Tells to inspire. I hope that you are all excited to listen to episode 12 and uh, episode 13 as well. 12 and 13 are kind of the midway point of our season one, uh, and it's also kind of a turning point in the story. Uh, after these two episodes, we do a lot more character focused episodes, which I am a huge fan of. And you know, that's kind of a big regret I have from the first half of season one of Tales to Inspire was not doing more. More um, character centered stuff. So I'm excited to say that the back half of Tales to Inspire will feature a lot more of these wonderful characters doing their wonderful things. And speaking of wonderful characters doing wonderful things, let's give a shout out to Drac. Drac, thank you so much for being on these episodes. I want to give them a huge shout out for the energy they brought. They did not half-ass their role at all as our first guest star on Tales to Inspire. Uh, and I'm just blown away by Drac and by Red Revenant. And um, the choices that they are going to make in episodes 12 and 13... As you know, our show is fully supported by the generous monthly donations of our patrons on Patreon. And unfortunately, our patronage has dropped significantly in the past few months. Now, I understand uh, this is kind of the cycle of a patron-supported show. Uh, people come and they go. Uh, but right now, they have gone so much that we have fallen beneath our $400 a month goal. At $400 a month, I am able to pay our performers and our guest stars like Drac $5 for every hour they spend recording with us. Uh, and right now, I, I am still paying our performers. However, the Misconceptions bank account is getting very low. So if you like Tales to Inspire, if you like all the wonderful voices and the wonderful people behind those voices, please consider clicking the link in the show notes, going to our Patreon, and giving any amount that you can. At the start of this new year, we have a new tier, a reward tier if you want to call it, in our Patreon. It's at the $20 a month club. And at the $20 a month club, you will be mailed a sticker from us. It'll always be a random sticker, uh, but it might have a logo, might have a character, uh, might feature some artwork that you would like to slap up somewhere. Uh, but at $20 a month, we are going to send all of our $20 and up patrons a sticker to say thank you for supporting us. Now, I understand not everybody can give $20 a month. $20 a month is a lot. So if you can't give $20 a month, but you still want to support the show, the $1, the $2, and the $5 option are all affordable. They're all easy payments to make each month, and it is really going to help us out. 
I don't want all of our patrons to be at the $20 level. That That's exhaustive on your bank accounts. I don't want to put that pressure on you or your money or your monthly budget. But if all of our listeners gave at the $5 a month, we would be able to get back to our $400 a month goal very easily. So don't think that you have to go for the $20 a month level. Just do $5. Do, do whatever you can. We would appreciate any support that you you can muster. And to our patrons who are still supporting us and have been supporting us for so long, thank you so much for being such a positive force behind this show, for making it able for us to bring characters like Red Revenant on, actors like Draconix, and for us to continue to make our show bigger and better every year. I thank you so much, patrons, for all of your support. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the story. Meanwhile, inside House der Kunst. Um, and I think we just see some of the art here. Um, the, the Nazis stole a lot of art. Uh, in fact, as part of their, their kind of cultural purge, they deemed a lot of art, um, like, uh, barbaric, less than, uh, and they would take it and hoard it away. And so I think, uh, as you were walking around, you see all these... Uh, Nazi sympathizers and bootlickers and psychophants all dressed up, all wearing proudly uh, these red pants with the black swastika on them, looking around at this art. And I think um, there is a section of it where there is this quote unquote barbaric art, uh, this beautiful art, but the Nazis have deemed, deemed it inappropriate and less than. Um, and I think they are walking with the, their flutes of. Uh, wine in their hands, their noses turned up at this art, and then I think the rest of the exhibit is kind of this patriotic, warmongering, uh, perfect race kind of depictions. Um, there is, um, I, I, I think there are some artist depiction of like the war front, uh, like the war in um, uh, the USSR. Uh, I think there is a painting that someone has done of Ubermensch and the Nazi soldiers walking down uh, Paris towards the Champ uh, the Champelices. Um, there is even like a uh, uh, a portrayal of the fall of London, though that has not happened yet. Uh, the artist is imagining the the Nazi flag flying from the top of Big Banner, banners draped over the face of it. Um, and this, it's just walking around here, seeing this art, it's disturbing. It's disturbing how okay these people are with this rhetoric and this ideology. And there is even a, um, so I talked a lot about paintings, but there is kind of a, um, oh, what would, what would you call it? Like a, um, not a diorama. Okay, break character for a second. In Zoolander, he's showing him the school for kids, and he says, what is this, a school for ants? What is that? What would you call that? Uh, it'd be like a, I mean, architectural model is another way of putting it. but Mo- A model, yeah. A model. A model, idiot. Okay, <laughs> another Zoolander <laughs> quote. There we go. Um, okay, back in character. I think uh, in the middle, there is this kind of cleared out space, and we see a architectural model of the city of Linz, uh, Adolf Hitler's hometown. And we see it has been made fit a place for a king. He wants to make this the cultural center of his new empire. Uh, and you see, just like this building is so blocky and garish, you see a lot of that architecture Uh, has been used to tear down the old historical buildings that were in Linz and replace them with these types of structures. These just... They're ugly, dudes. They're just (laughs) ugly brick rectangular buildings. Um, Very utilitarian. Um, But you're you're walking around looking at all this. Are you... Is there any sort of conversation going on between you two, or are you just kind of looking at this? 
This is uncomfortable, to say the least. Yes, it is. I have not been back in Germany for several years. I imagine it wasn't this bad the last time you were here? I left shortly after Hitler took over. It was not nearly this xenophobic. David, are there any recognizable uh, Nazi officials? Uh, people that I would recognize in any Ooh. way. I mean, this is a Nazi party. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nazi party. Um, <laughs> but I think we, as you're looking around, you see the faces of lots of upper class, inner circle um, Nazi officials. So you see all these people walking around, uh, laughing, waiting for the the man of the hour to join them. Um, I would be like subtly gesturing them out to uh, Red Revenant here um, and telling him their names and t- uh, having him relay that information to the other group. Um, just kind of letting everyone know who all's here and all that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think um, while you are pointing them out, you, you point over to two, uh, Joseph Goebbels, the minister of propaganda, and uh, Heinrich Himmler, the leader of the SS. And they are laughing, <laughs> talking, and they're talking with a third person. And this person laughs. And Red Revenant, your heart skips for a second. Because you know that laugh. You've heard that laugh before. It has been in your nightmares and in your waking dreams. And as I think you stand there, uh, those two Nazi officials walk away and this person turns around. They are wearing a tux. They have a top hat, a cane with a uh, silver handle on it. And they turn around, and I think they lock eyes with you. And this person looks at you and says, Imika, my, my, what are you doing here? And then we have a little yellow box that just says, The Gaslighter. I think like the second where he just kind of stares in silence before giving just a little smile and just saying, I'm just here admiring the art uh, with my friend over here and gestures over to Dr. Fusion. What are you doing here? Well, it seems my business is quite profitable during the war and he smiles wryly. You should know my business better than anyone, Imika. Yes, I... I do. Well, that's, that's a coincidence, because I'm also here on business. I've been hired as a bodyguard of sorts, of some of the folks here. This is the only way I could really get into a place like this, so it's not really surprising that I'm here as part of the workforce. I'm sure, I'm sure. My friends in British intelligence have told me about your bodyguard activities, or should I say, your body count activities. He just takes a deep breath. I'm sorry, I did not catch your name. I am Dr. Friedrich Munch. Uh, it is plain pleased to meet you. He shakes his hand, or er, he shakes your hand. And he says, uh, I'm not in the business of giving out my name, but you may call me Gaslighter. Not a very positive name, is it? That would be your interpretation, I presume. Well, gaslighting is typically viewed as a um, form of emotional abuse, so I'm not sure why you would wish to name yourself after such things. 
he just smiles at you politely and tilts his head. And he looks back at Emika. Tell me, how is Lady Crawler doing nowadays? Have you seen much of her? Is there a role I can do to, like, compose myself? (laughs) (laughs) Roll to stop him from doing damage. Yeah. Um... I mean, let me, let me look, that would make let's him look at these want moves. to jump at him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think. Maybe seize control, like seizing control of the situation. I was, I was also thinking situation. kind of a seize control. <laughs> that makes sense. Sure, sure. Well, no, go ahead and roll a seize control, and let's have you roll uh, 2d6 plus your... Let's do influence. Oh, I didn't roll great then. Um, (laughs) I rolled a seven. Okay, a seven. I mean, you still succeed. So on a seven through nine, you get to choose one. You seize control over what was contested, but your opponent attacks you in retaliation. You enter into an action scene. Or you seize control over what was contested, but the effort exhausts you. Mark a condition. Oh, I think Mark and a condition makes sense. Um, okay. So yeah, like just clenches his um, fists, um, probably tight enough that kind of like draws blood in the palm of his hand as he nails it again. And I'm going to mark the condition angry. Mm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, uh, it's definitely clear through gritted che- teeth, though he's trying his best to just smile. Um, just says, she's... She's not here, so I'd say she, wherever she is, she's in a much better place. Hmm, quite. Well, Imiko, it was quite nice seeing you again, and he smiles again, just that sickening, frustrating smile. I'm so very proud of what you've become. And he turns to uh, Dr. Fusion. Mr. Munch? Uh, enjoy the art. And he walks away, his cane tip-tapping on the marble flooring beneath him. I want to see if I can get some information out of some, some of the people here. And Red Revenant is going to just walk away. Okay. Um, and uh, then I think we turn the page to Geiger Gwyn. Uh, Geiger Gwyn, you have wandered off to find Sister Solstice. Where have you gone to look for her? Uh, well, you see a couple panels of her just weaving through people. Uh, she grabs a flute of champagne off a thing. She looks at some art, talks randomly to people like, oh, yeah, he looks like he doesn't have a stick so- shoved up his ass in that one. That's great. Then she just moves on. <laughs> and uh, are, you, are you saying this in English or do you speak German? <laughs> Oh, no, Gwen just speaks English. <laughs> the language bypasses all other languages. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, so I just like mumble that random things to people as I'm walking by, watch their face, and I just wink at them, keep going. Um, keeping a lookout for Sister Solsis. Um, and I'm going to head towards the back of the venue thinking like if I haven't run into her yet you know I will eventually okay, okay. Um, so you you're walking yep um, you're, you're talking to all these people you make these random comments in English and these uh, German art goers just kind of look at each other and they have those little word bubbles in German of like who is this woman um, uh, and you just keep going keep going keep going and you work towards the back and you have entered into a new part of the venue that's kind of separated by red curtains, red velvet curtains that have been pulled back. Uh, and as you enter into here, you see the uh, like bronze statues of the uh, German eagle. Uh, I'm sure it has a title for it, but I cannot remember it. With the swastika clutched in its talons, set on marble pillars, just kind of lining this red velvet walkway all the way to the back where there's this dais set up. And you see three uh, portraits have been hung there. Three portraits of Hitler. One portrait is of Hitler in Joseph Stalin's room, uh, in his uh, office. 
in Moscow. The other is of him sitting on the throne in London with the crown jewels on his head, whatever that circular thing is, and the cane. Uh, was it? Is it Eden? Is it the Apple of Eden, or is that just an Assassin's Creed thing? <laughs> I think that might be just an Assassin's Creed thing, but I have no idea. I don't know what's going. Sure, is the Apple of Eden <laughs> orb? <laughs> <laughs> the orb, yeah, it has an orb and it has a cross on it. I know what you're talking about. I'm from the UK and I have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was hoping, <laughs> I was hoping Drac would save me. And they don't. I they care don't. very little for anything monarchy related. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's fine. It's fair. It's fair. Uh, so, anyways, holding holding those that paraphernalia of nobility, and then the other is is of him sitting behind a desk that you have seen before in a room that you have been before in the Oval Office. You see these three portraits hung here as the the examples of the end point of this war. So you see a panel of her just walking up slowly to that last photo and Mm -hmm. staring at it very intently. She just downs the rest of her champagne. (laughs) Yeah, and as you down the rest of your champagne, uh, you hear a commotion. A lot of voices talking. And you turn and you see, coming from a door from somewhere further in the house there, you see a procession of soldiers. And then stepping through the door, you see the target, Adolf Hitler, the perpetrator of these racist ideas, the instigator of this war that has killed millions and will maybe kill millions more if it is allowed to continue. You see him step through the doors. And as he does, there is a... a Achtung! And then you see all these people in this area click their heels together and throw up their hands in that Nazi salute. And I think the way they are drawn, uh, they are all kind of monochrome and just like kind of, they're all drawn in the same posture. And I think that draws attention to how Geiger Gwynn is not doing that salute. I think the artist has drawn it very purposefully to show that. Geiger Gwen, how do you react to this? Well, you see a little thought bubble show up, and she's just like, Honey, the devil has entered the building. She's going to slowly start to follow the group of um, Nazi security that's surrounding Hitler. Okay. Um, and at this time, we cut inside the kitchen. Uh, Sister Solstice, you have been dutifully preparing this uh, I've meal. I've been chopping these vegetables. Yeah, so when we <laughs> left you, you had like a box full of vegetables next to you and now as we turn the page back to you, that box is empty and we just have a pile of chopped vegetables on the other side of you. Uh, and this this cross uh, chef walks up to you and is shouting at you in German again and he points to the cake. Um, is the cake so big that I couldn't carry it? The cake is ostentatiously large. Think like Cake Boss. This is not the Cake Boss. So is it on a wheelie cart? It is on a wheelie cart, yes. Excellent. I am going to get a big smile on my face and nod my head (laughs) and go over to the wheelie cart cake Uh and uh, begin pushing it to the door to the venue Mm, in the kitchen. And you start pushing it out, and the doors are open for you. And as you step out... This is bad. This is very this is bad. Very bad. Um, as you step out, uh, Geiger Gwen, you're in this kind of room with everybody, and you see you see Sister Solstice pushing a cake out on a cart out into the middle, and she is walking straight towards Adolf Hitler. And I just have like big eyes and a huge smile on my face because I don't know what else to do. Yeah, just this terrified thirteen-year-old child pushing a cake. Oh god! Um, Perfect. We should have been in the cake. I know, right? <laughs> should have been. Um, Doctor Fusion is trying to integrate himself into a group of people that it would make sense for Hitler to approach. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you see a lot of those Nazi officials that you saw earlier that like. Like uh, bugs towards a flame, they're just must go kiss ass, um, going towards the fjord. Um, and back to Sister Solstice, as she is pushing this cake, everybody in this room bursts out in singing 
Happy Birthday in German to Hitler. Meanwhile, on the rooftop of Haus der Kunst. Um, okay, and then we, we turn the page from that uh, back to the rooftop. Uh, what have the three of you been doing? So, um, Crystal Gazer largely has been, like, sticking near Torchbearer. Um, and occasionally, as they're walking, like, the perimeter or, like, looking at stuff or, like, looking because there's, like, uh, um, like, what are the, what is the glass in the ceiling called? <laughs> um, the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> We're breaking it. We're breaking uh, that They're breaking it. No, Break it. We're not doing it. Yeah, that. it's a skylight, yeah. The skylight. Closer. Um, so we like looking down on the skylight at what's happening down there um occasionally as you kind of see her like looking around and doing things she looks up to torchbearer and will say things like you don't really think ubermensch would come here right i mean what need would the would there be for him to be at any event you know he just seems like a real to brings a room down you know i'm honestly surprised he's not here already uh stone statue like that fit right in. Yeah. I'm so. looking forward to round two. <laughs> the, the two of you jump as omission suddenly speaks. Yeah. I, I'm glad I'm glad one of us is then because I spent a long time in that hospital room after that. I, I don't think I've taken the proper time to to let you know that, that I'm sorry that I couldn't be there. And you, I hope you know that I would have, if things had been different. I know it. I, uh, I wish you had been, but, uh, I made it. So that's what matters, right? Yeah. You made it. And he's not here, so I have to believe that he's got some other important job to do somewhere else hopefully we can take care of business here while he's gone right I agree I I believe that too and as you say that with one of those spotlights that were scanning the skyline for uh, any ships or bombers, we see just a small figure pass through the cone of light pointed towards the sky And as it gets closer and closer, we see the black knee-high boots of Ubermensch alight on the cement walkway outside of Haus der Kunst. Uh, And he straightens his uh, double-colored cape and kind of straightens up, stands erect, and starts walking up the steps to Haus der Kunst. Uh, Which one of you sees him first? I was thinking, like, if Omission sees him, uh, he's just going to drop, like, a grenade pin in his path uh, and then just kind of, like, uh, hide again. Just, you know, so that maybe he remembers and probably doesn't remember fondly. Can, uh, Can he do that and Crystal Gazer just happen to look, step up to the edge? (laughs) oh <laughs> uh, like uh, like ubermensch <laughs> follows the pin and like looks up and sees you yeah and the look of just horror on her face absolutely yeah so mitch do you have a live grenade or does uh, omission have a live grenade or do you just have like a pin that you draw yeah i, I figure he, like he just collects things in his uh pocket so like just like it's not a live grenade or anything just kind of just a pin he feels a kindredness to a, a uh, grenade pin and something that you just immediately forget about. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Exactly. You pull it, you discard it, and you don't you don't use it, nor do you care for it or <laughs> tell it you love it. <laughs> yeah, yep, yeah, okay, this is happening. Uh, yeah, so you drop. He's walking up the steps, and we just see an onomatopoeia of clink. As this pin bounces down the steps and lands on the step right in front of him. And he looks down and looks up towards the roof. 
And uh, Crystal Gazer, what does he see? A very, very shocked Crystal Gazer in a, um, she's not wearing her normal, like, she's wearing, like, a little, like, women's suit thing, very, like, era-specific, like, thing, and she's just standing there, and I think that we see it kind of fade into the look that he, right before he hits her in the, in the previous fight with, like, all the carnage behind her, and it, like, shifts to that and then shifts back. And she says, hey, he, he's here. What? What did you say? He's here. Uberman's is here. And you, she like, she's ruffling in her pockets. And she like finally grabs the finger and like squeezes it. And like the, she sends a telepathic message down to Red Revenant. Uberman is here. We'll do what we can to slow him down. Do what you have to do. End of episode. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Tales to Inspire. We'll be back with our next episode on January 16th. If you have social media, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Like and follow us at Misconceptions Pod for up-to-date information about the show, behind-the-scenes pictures, and just to show us your general positive feelings about the show. We also have a Discord. You can click the link below to join our Discord so that you can chat with other friends of the show and chat with other cast members directly. We also have an email. If you'd like to contact us that way, you can email us at misconceptionspod at gmail.com. This show is fully supported by the generous monthly donations of our patrons on Patreon. If you would like to join that elite group of supporters and gain access to exclusive content please consider joining our Patreon. The Tells to Inspire theme song was composed by Esteban Del Pino. You can find out more about his music on fiverr.com slash I-A-M underscore W-A-K-E. This week's special guest character was Red Revenant, played by Draconix. You can find them at Draconix on Twitter. Omission was played by Mitchell Wallace, who can be found at Mitch Bustillos on Twitter. Crystal Gazer was played by Marlo Bogus, who can be found at Marlo Bogwich on Twitter. Torchbearer was played by Phil Montgomery, who can be found at BMC Philanthropy on Twitter. Geiger Gwyn was played by Christy Scheidemantel, who can be found at Polish Christy on Twitter. Dr. Fusion was played by Occam Razor, who can be found at Occam Sockam Robo on Twitter. Sister Solstice was played by Carrie White, who hates Twitter and refuses to get one. And I'm David White, your editor-in-chief. You can find me at Mr. Banana Socks on Twitter. The role-playing game system used in this production was a modified version of the Worlds in Peril role-playing game by Sam Joko Publishing, featuring elements from the Avatar Legends role-playing game and Masks A New Generation role-playing game, both by Magpie Games. Tales to Inspire is a product of the Misconceptions Podcast Network. Find out more about our other shows and buy cool merch at misconceptionspod.com. And that's it for this week's episode of Tales to Inspire. Thank you so much for listening, and keep it nerdy, y'all.